Thank you very much, Prof. I think um, we as a people have neglected security in this nation for a pretty long time. And governments, uh, particularly governments, have paid casual attention to security. Security is expensive, and if you neglect it over a long time, it will collapse in your hands. And I looked at uh, Obidati uh, Manifesto, and I think it has very well captured the problems with the Nigeria security. Uh, one of them is looking at the security sector reform. The security sector needs indeed a thorough reformation. If you check our security, they are working in, in isolation. The police has no relationship with the armed forces more often than not, even within the armed forces. Instead of having an integrated command, there are separate commands. And there is no way they can harmonize in such a way as to achieve the desires, um, the desires of Nigeria. So let me begin by asking if General Henry Ayola, who's focal person uh, on security and defense uh, in our policy uh, review and future view team, is on. Is General Ayola on? Yes, I'm on. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, General. Yeah, perhaps you can orient us. Uh, um, on the position of the Obidati uh, team on security and defense. Uh, when we had the glitch, we had the privilege of uh, General Obiu Mahi um, beginning to speak to issues of, if you will, uh, integration for seamless uh, pol policy execution. But uh, give us, uh, uh, if you may, the seven pillars and um, let's then have a conversation uh, here. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, good day, all participants. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us excuse me, as a nation to retake our nation and to craft a system that will work. Uh, I'd like to say from the outset that the, the state of the insecurity of the nation uh, is premised on what I would call some precedent conditions of uh, what was on ground before the challenges came on board. And hence, uh, the, the ability to address the challenges uh, have been also hampered by the state we found ourselves before those challenges came in. So in the, in the Obidati and the Labor Party security sector agenda for the nation, I'm going to highlight uh, the seven main points, uh, seven pillars, if you like. Number one is that there's going to be a holistic review of the national security architecture. Uh, I mean, the national security architecture mouthed again and again uh, in recent time. But what exactly it is, and why is it what it is? What has it been? Has it been a default architecture, or has it been a deliberately crafted architecture premised on appropriate, you know, analysis, threat analysis, vulnerability evaluation, risk assessment of the nation? from which you then move on you know, to review uh, the security architecture and craft one that will address all the issues in the holistic pattern. That's number one. Number two, there is also going to be a review and strengthening of the National Security Council. Of course, the National Security Council is simply a creation of the Constitution, just simply mentioned. Uh, and not much is said as to is uh, organization other than the list of the members and what the working uh, system and the checklist for doing those things should be. 
So that, that would be addressed uh, appropriately. And the Office of the National Security Advisor, which provides the Secretariat for the National Security Council, will then be strengthened also and will be indeed a, you know, a coordination center you know, as relating to national security, intelligence, and all of that. Number three, there's also going to be an expansion of the national intelligence community. One of the things we have not done well as a nation is putting in place a framework that enables us to put forward our best foot concerning any issue. Nigeria is so endowed by very many gifted, highly talented people and extraordinary collection of people who have so much to offer. But the way we have designed our system thus far is only those in government that have the opportunity of even you know, having to, to bring in their ideas. And sometimes when you write papers, there have been a thousand and one papers written. But once you are not the one there, it's like, uh, you know, they look at you and say, excuse me, if you know what to do, how come you are not the one here? But it ought to be a matter of a system where the best, the collective best of the nation is what we are putting forward in solving any national issue. Okay, so that is going to be entrenched. Number four, there is going to be an introduction also of the security and the subsectors of the security, particularly the defense and all the others, a higher management system that ensures certain instruments and tools for control of those apparatus, structures, institutions, and the entire process and procedure. Now, that, that would be entrenched. That also has been lacking. Since independence, we are neither here or there as to where we stand in some of these things. I mean, the such tools like having a, you know, of course, for several years until 2001, we did not even have a national security strategy. And what we got in 2001 was a 10-page grand strategy for national security. And thereafter, we had the national security strategy in 2014, which was reviewed in 2019, you know, and all of that. And of course, there are several other acts and policies that need to be converged and be focused on in designing uh, that uh, this kind of system that works in other places. And there are several examples we can learn from. Number five is to craft a strategic framework for unified operations. Now, what, what do we mean by that? We have seen so much of the armed forces being called out to solve problems when the crisis go beyond what the police and other paramilitary agencies can handle. But when they are called out, what, what framework is there for them to work in collaboration? And who handles what and all of that. It, it, it needs to be put in, as a laid down regulation, not just at the instance of who is holding the office at a time. You know, we have done so much of that. And sometimes it's like, well, if you like the face of the man who is there, you, you collaborate or cooperate with him. If you don't, you do something otherwise. No, it's not supposed to be left to the whims and caprices of the operators. There should be appropriate framework at each level of those organizations and services, who and who is relating with who and what needs to be done. Okay, that's, uh, that's uh, number five. And number six is going to be a review of national emergency response system. We have seen our capacity to respond to national emergency it has not been the best. And that's because we, we've tried one model or the other without being neither here or there. And sometimes you find that it's a, there is a, NEMA used to be a prostitute under the presidency, reporting directly you know, to the vice president. And now it's been put under the Ministry of Humanitarian Intervention. Okay? And still, it, it doesn't get the work done that way because the other agencies that are supposed to be coordinated are not even under NEMA. Neither, neither are they under Ministry of uh, Humanitarian Intervention. In, in other climes, what you do is to aggregate the first responders and the major responding agencies and put them under one umbrella, like the Ministry of Interior. So when there's an emergency, it's not a matter of begging people to respond. Because there will be people who've been training together, who've been operating together, who have done several rehearsals and, and disaster games, and you know, so they can really relate 
And so when there is a real emergency, it's not that they are trying to get what to do. They will have been used to working with one another. So that will be put there. And all of these uh, great ideas would not, of course, find proper footing until the number seven pillar, which is making a list of several agenda items for the legislation, uh, for legislature to handle. Of course, we know that if you're going to review existing policies and acts, then of course we get to go back to the legislature. Okay, so that is the seventh uh, pillar. And with all this, we hope that we'll be able to address the perennial insecurity in Nigeria. Of course, we all know the criticality of security. Without security, development, progress, and all of that cannot follow. Thank you very much. I hope uh, I've been able to highlight those. There's no question that the central place of security in progress, in development, is there. In fact, the AU had a, a special conference on this subject in um, Algeria, in um, Morocco. I was privileged to give it a, a presentation at it uh, last uh, December, I think. Uh, 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 and so our work is cut out for us. How do we operationalize these ideas in the uh, document that we have here? Um, let's start uh, with General Mahi here and then Captain Maru, uh, from their experience, will give us a sense for what is critically required. And then I, will, <clears throat> I want to talk to turn to a particular issue. And, and fortunately, we have uh, joining us from Atlanta, um, uh, Olivia Diokbara, who uh, is in the security services out there. Uh, because I want in this relationship between agencies to ask her when she's going to come on. You know, in the U.S., you have besides say the military command and all of that, and policing, you have. Um, the, um, uh, um, uh, what do you call the, the reserves? And uh, there's a particular one that's almost escaping me in this moment. Uh, mental block, where you? National you, you Guard. Have, Guard, National Guard. <laughs> We've talked about this. National, National Guard. Guard. How the governor activates the National Guard versus where police uh, capacity is uh, limited uh, and ultimately when the military comes in. How all of that relate? I would like her to probably uh, uh, open that conversation. But to you, uh, General Mahi, what do we need to do to begin to implement? Well, um, thank you, uh, Prof, and thank you, General Ayola, for all um, you have presented. I, I think um, the way to start is uh, that we need to reform the security sector. If we properly reform the security sector, we'll be addressing issues like unity of command. Mm. When there is an operation that involves more than a service, mm. there must be a unified command where others will flow from. Now what we have is disjointed. Each service issues others in fact, the chief of defense staff mm -hmm. has no troops. Mm -hmm. So how can he implement his dream policies? So that issue should be addressed. By the way, in talking about that, how does our ch uh, ch uh, chief of defense staff, as you, you know, differ from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs in the U.S. structure, for example? Well, it's, it, the chairman of U.S. Uh, Joint uh, Chiefs of Staff is that it's he has the powers of command. Mm. All the troops are under him in terms of operations. Mm. All the, the Pacific Command, mm. the uh, European Command, they are all if, Even the African High Command. Even the African High Command, they are right directly under him. Mm. So he issues directives, and then the various commands interpret it as it affects them, mm -hmm. and then do the uh, an analysis estimate process mm. and come up with the approach they require to carry out. And within each of these commands, you find out that Air Force is there, Army is there, mm. Air Force is there, Navy is there. Mm. And where appropriate, other uh, security services. But in Nigeria, it is a different ball game. I am not subtracting from the fact that the security agencies are trying their best, 
But there are things we need to do to make things work seamlessly, to make us harness mm. all the advantages we should have mm. because we have the, uh, the, the, the defense, we have other security agencies. Now, secondly, we need to be, it's very uh, gladdening that Obidati have been brave enough to say that Nigeria requires state police. Nobody can shoot and normally cry more than the bereaved. Mm. It, the governors are chief security officers in their states, but they do not have troops, they do not have uh, the security agency they can use to effect that uh, uh, role that the constitution has given unto them. Mm. So, Obidati have the courage to tell Nigerians that this is part of the, 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 the critical problem we have in Nigeria. Mm. And that is why the state governors resorted to uh, this uh, vigilante. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to give, it, 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 it's a good thing they have done, but the problem is it has a lot of implications. You give arms to people who are not trained to bear arms. You give instruments of violence to people who are not trained to manage them. So what could happen is that such people could eventually begin to use the arms, as some of them are using it now, for their selfish interests. And if you study the history of Pakistan, mm. that is what gave rise to warlords mm. that have territories carved out for themselves. You have a political leader in a position, he cannot take any policy decision without consulting the warlords. That is where we are going. And Almost I think we should the way, the way Somalia even went. Uh, Captain Umar, uh, what's your perspective on how we can really enforce a system that will secure and unite Nigeria? Indeed, sir. Securing and uniting Nigeria is a straightforward and very, very possible task, particularly when we take out the nuances and all the, what I call, unwritten protocols that inform command on the field. And how can this be done? This can be done what, what I want to call low foot, low hanging foot measures is we must be able to requ demand results mm -hmm. from troops on the ground. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be happening right now because everyone is virtually working towards, you know, getting their own accolades from mm -hmm. the man they are loyal to. Mm -hmm. But when it becomes a result driven thing, Marching results to expectations, marching results to costs. You see, we begin to take out the frills from the skirt so we can be able to know who can deliver and who has challenges delivering. Mm -hmm. Let me use a, a very uh, potent example which my two senior uh, officers have made mention of. If you go out there on the field and you see the defense, for example, the, the chief of defense staff, for example, we, we should recall that he was redeployed from the operations theater to his present office, but he was troopless. It's like tying one's hands behind his back. Mm. We have there a very potent soldier, one, a soldier's soldier, but then he is somebody that could be akin to one who has a soul willing, but the body is weak. Mm. When the body of men to execute is not on ground, there is no way you can achieve any results. Then all the nuances and the shenanigans start creeping in. Mm -hmm. From the body language of the Obidati movement, we are seeing people who want to actually take out the meat and get straight to the bone. We are seeing people who want to match costs with results. We are seeing people who want to say, if you can ask for X, Y, Z much, then you must be able to tell us what much we can expect for the X, Y, Z you are getting. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's virtually like it's open. We see humongous amounts being sunk, and they just end up as sunk costs. Because nobody has been able to say, you know what, this is what you have asked for this monies for. And we are going to give it, and this is how much we expect. Yeah, let me very quickly piggyback on this, the problem of architecture. Intelligence is often said to be an issue. Why does it seem like the intelligence agencies are operating in isolation? 
in many countries, intelligence is probably job one. May, may I boldly respond to your question like this, sir? Mm. You see, no matter the intelligence you have, and I've always said it on other fora, if you are not intelligent, it will be useless to you. Mm. You see, the user of intelligence, ab initio, has to be intelligent too. Mm. So if you don't match intelligence with intelligent people, mm. then intelligence will be useless. We have a lot of intelligence. Intelligence is virtually all over us every day, particularly when it comes to the kind of threats we have. Goat herders, bandits, localists, who haven't really gotten the kind of formal training and upper hands we have. But then if there's not a process that is going to ensure that the intelligence we have is handled by intelligent people, then we'll just continue to recycle intelligence that goes in and comes out just the way it went in. Yes, yes. You see, um, there is something very, very critical when you want to improve on your intelligence sourcing. That is what is called civil military relations. Mm. If civil military relations is seamless, mm then every Nigerian will be an intelligence source. Mm. But now, more often than not, the Nigerians see security agencies as enemies, yeah. not as friends. Mm. And that is what the system <coughs> has created. Mm. We have a system that uses the security agencies against the people. You see, politicians use them against their opponents. So they see the security agencies as enemies to themselves. They have information that intelligence that could help this nation get out of security quagmire, they keep it to themselves. And some of them even divulge security information to the, uh, to the uh, uh, militants, to enemy, to adversaries. So we need to deal with the issue of civil military relations as an important tool to setting security rights. Nigeria. It's a very important point. Uh, uh, Professor, let yeah. me to say a word about that. Okay, General. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for your inputs, my fellow officers. Uh, joining my, I mean, agreeing with my fellow officers, I, I just want to put it in the perspective of uh, when we said uh, a holistic uh, review of the national security architecture. It's actually to bring a system of systems approach. Mm -hmm. Some of the reasons, like uh, Katoyama said and like General uh, Obi said, is, is the fact that there are loopholes in the current system that we're on. Because it's not properly structured as a system of systems where the nodes and the joints are all taken care of. So even if you have the best of intelligence, if the operating services and forces are not able to use intelligence, if they are response time is not enhanced by availability of the required logistics. I mean, I give the very common example. If uh, if a civilian calls a police station nearest to his house and say, oh, I saw something suspicious in so-and-so -so address, so, so time, and all that. Now, in, in that police station, they don't have even a vehicle to take off to respond to this. It's not really intelligent because there is a joint system in which the appropriate are not empowered to respond in just time. Quick response is not achieved because of that. Not only that, because we have not taken serious, uh, critical look at what we run. Even the location of our security agencies and unis and operations center. Obviously, very uh, important points uh, being made there, uh, a glitch, but we have to move on very quickly. We are coming towards the end of this uh, panel because there's so much uh, to uh, engage with. Uh, but just in one quick 30, 30 second comment, what should be job one, day one, for somebody who wants to secure this country? Just quick. For me, of, it goes beyond security restructure. When you restructure, everything will fall in place. When you review the security sector appropriately and insist that it has to be enforced, everything will fall in place. Thank you. For me, 
security will remain that either, that mm. social either, within which all else will thrive. Without it, we but, just... Very true. I mean, we can't go to the farm if we're going to get kidnapped. And if we don't farm, we will not be able to eat. Exactly. Inflation will hit us. And the vicious cycle goes round.